And we pray that your word would transform in our lives, in our community, in our country, whatever it is that needs to be brought in line with your will and the values of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Ify and Andrew. We've seen in <clears throat> the space of one or two generations the move in our country from being what was generally recognized to be a, a Christian country with Christian values held at the center of its public life to a country which is now generally recognized as being post-Christian. The way to see that is simply open your paper or turn on the news and you'll see everywhere on every page, on every screenshot you see, uh, that the fact that we've moved now into a, a culture which is no longer explicitly Christian as it was. <clears throat> and the United Kingdom has a, a crisis in its identity. We're all wondering what it means to be a citizen of the United Kingdom. There was the Scottish referendum. Were the Scottish people going to want to stay in this kingdom? Or were they going to leave? It threw it all up in the air, didn't it? I'm rather glad, personally, they want to stay in the United Kingdom. And then, of course, there's this ongoing debate, which is now going to get hotter and hotter. Uh, do we want to stay in the United, the European Union, or not? In or out is going to be one of the big questions coming our way. And uh, we all know what um, UKIP think about that. But... The danger in the post-Christian society, it seems to me, is that the values of the kingdom of God get forgotten, are eclipsed by all sorts of other debates that seem to be so important. What it is to be a member of the United Kingdom seems to have become far more important to, than what it means to be a member of the kingdom of God. And it raises close in its heels the key question who actually is in charge? If we don't know that God is in charge of the entire created order, the entire cosmos, then of course we get blown around all over the place by one wind or another. General election is coming our way. How will you vote? How are you going to vote? Will your faith inform how you vote? Or will it be all kinds of other forces? Do you come to church to get away from all that stuff? Or do you come to church to identify your place as a child of God within the kingdom of God? And that all other decisions you might have to make will fall in behind that primary place that you have as a child in God's kingdom. Let's <clears throat> look at this um, by stepping out of 2014 United Kingdom and going right back in history to 8th century Israel. Okay, I'm going to take you back there now. In a minute we're going to hear a passage of scripture about something that happened in those days. You'll remember that uh, King David was uh, the, the guy who, who set up the, the Jerusalem as the center of the, the Jewish worship of the people of God there in Judah, and you'll remember how it was his son, uh, um, Solomon, who was the one who was a, appointed, anointed by God to build the first temple, this magnificent temple, and how the kingdom of God was, was mightily uh, blessed in those days of King David and King Solomon. But you'll remember as you grind your way through those passages in, in uh, the historical passages of the scriptures, the ones we tend to forget because it's so gritty. Um, you'll remember how there was a, a time when a guy came along called Jeroboam. And Jeroboam thought, hmm, 
I fancy being in charge around here. I'm not sure, too sure about Solomon. And ho so, cut a long story short, he really split the kingdom in two. And there was Judah, and then there were all the other tribes um, in the north. And the northern kingdom was then separate from the kingdom of the south, and it was called the kingdom of Israel, with its center, its capital, in Samaria. And this guy, Jeroboam, um, thought, well, to, sit, to make sure I've established my cult and my leadership and everything, I need to make, set, have a few uh, golden idols created to remind the people who it was that delivered them of old out of slavery in Egypt. So he had these golden idols fashioned, and he set up all kinds of shrines on the high places around the country, and uh, he an, uh, appointed all kinds of priests to keep this um, cult going. Lots and lots of different bales. Polytheism. Choose your own God. Watch out which God you're following, because today's God might be tomorrow's enemy. So they would be blown around by every wind, these uh, people of the northern kingdom of Israel. There was a man left called Elijah, who... hadn't forgotten what God had laid on the heart of the prophets and the kings that had gone before. He hadn't forgotten the words that God had given Moses of old. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven or above or the earth beneath or the waters below. You shall not bow to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to thousand, a thousand generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. There, the first two commandments. Of the, ten, uh, of the Ten Commandments, given to Moses. Elijah in his day, centuries later, had not forgotten that. And he'd not forgotten the, the primary prayer of the people of God, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord, is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commands that I give you today are to be put on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Elijah had not forgotten the primacy of the law. Around him, there were hundreds and hundreds of, of uh, priests who'd completely forgotten that and had fallen into polytheism, making your own gods, going their own way. So, Elijah's situation got more and more desperate. His life was under threat. The king of his day was Ahab, and he had Ahab had together with him this terrifying woman whose name was Jezebel, who uh, um, you, you, you'd want to run away if you saw Jezebel, because she was such a dangerous person. And Elijah knew that his life was in threat, but much more seriously, he knew that the, 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 the integrity of the religion of, of God, of the living God, was under threat and could disappear altogether unless God stepped in. So, this is what he did. This is 1 Kings 18. You might like to find 1 Kings 18 and find verse 21. Can you find that? 1 Kings 18. And I'm going to read from verse 21. <coughs> read from verse, verse 20, I think. Have we got the page there? 359. Page 359. Thank you, Nigel. So Ahab sent words throughout all of Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said to them all, 
How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. <clears throat> but if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. And then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood but not set it fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord. The God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one of the bulls and prepare it first, since there are so many of you. Call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. So they took the bull that was given to them and prepared it. Then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar they had made. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is God. Perhaps he's in deep thought, or busy, or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. So they shouted louder and slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. Midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come here to me. They came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took twelve stones, one for each of the tribes, descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. With the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench round it large enough to hold two sayers of seed. He arranged the wood, cut the bull into pieces, and laid it on the wood. Then he said to them, Fill four large jars with water, and pour it on the offering and on the wood. Do it again, he said, and they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered, and they did it a third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. All, when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. This is the word of the Lord. The Lord, in the Hebrew, Yahweh, or Jehovah as we used to say. Yahweh is Lord. It's an amazing story, isn't it? It's an incredible story. Who is in charge? Who is in charge? Yahweh is in charge. The Lord is in charge. I love the way Elijah seems to keep completely calm through the whole thing. As the uh, priests of Baal are getting more and more hysterical, more and more desperate, you can sort of picture Elijah there, just standing there, allowing the, 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 the test, the trial, the contest to unfold quite calmly, waiting to see how God would step in, the Lord would step in. If you jump over 
in your imagination into the New Testament and the days of Jesus. And imagine for a moment Jesus standing there at his trial before Pilate. And all the Jewish people around. Do you remember what they say to Pilate, all the Jewish people? They say, we have no other king other than Caesar. Caesar is our king. They don't say, Yahweh is our king. They say, Caesar's our king, the one down in Rome. Why do you think they say that? Political expediency. In that moment, they had forgotten that Yahweh is Lord. He is king. And it was more expedient to them to say that Caesar, your king. Do you remember how the crowd of Jewish people cried out, set Barabbas free. Let's have Barabbas set free. Knowing he was a criminal, knowing he was an insurrectionist trying to overthrow the, the, the Roman government of the day. Let's have Barabbas, who's incarcerated, let's have him set free and let's have Jesus crucified. Although they knew that Jesus had done nothing wrong. Political expediency it was more expedient to have Jesus crucified and Barabbas set free than to have Jesus set free, kept free. And then imagine the scene of the crucifixion. There is the three crosses, the central cross, Jesus dying on his cross. Pilate had put on it, the, on the sign in three languages, King, Je King of the Jews. King of the Jews. And at that moment, I guess it must have looked to absolutely everybody, Jew, Greek, and Gentile alike, it must have looked like that was the end of Jesus and that Caesar really was king. But beautifully, three days later, Jesus emerged from his tomb, appeared as the risen Lord. The risen Lord. Appearing to the women, then to the men. God vindicated himself at that tr contest that uh, Elijah had set up. God vindicated himself. He demonstrated in power that he was God and that all the bales were just pieces of wood, stone or whatever. Demonstrated that he was the living God. Jesus is vindicated as the, <coughs> as the risen, the crucified risen Lord. So you see... In Old Testament times, the people had to accept and believe, the challenge before them was forever to believe that God is one, not many, yeah, that he is one, and that he is unseen. You cannot see God. And however much they crave to make idols and have lots and lots and lots of gods, it's a kind of insurance policy, like the man who has mistresses in every town, you know. But one fall out with one, at least I've got 20 others, you know. Um, in, in that same sort of way, the people had to understand that they are the, the living God, the creator of the, everything that existed, the creators of heaven and earth, was one and unseen. And then, when they encountered Jesus of Nazareth, saw him die on that cross, saw him rise again, they came to believe that they had seen and touched and heard the Lord, Yahweh, the living one, Jesus, God in human flesh. So, if Jesus is king, yeah, if he really is king, we can't see him now, but we know his presence in our midst, in our hearts. If Jesus is king, then we need to put the values of his kingdom before everything else, knowing that he, as king, will vindicate himself. He will have his way on planet Earth in the end. However it may look at any moment in time in history, 
Jesus, God, will, values of his kingdom will be fulfilled. We pray, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah? So I want to take four little examples of what this might mean, coming back to where I started. Being a citizen of the United Kingdom, we are faced with choices. We are faced with important issues. But we need to see those against the backdrop of the values of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. So, if one core value of the kingdom of God is that every single person who has ever lived on this planet has been, is, will be made in the image of God, right? Then we're all equal under God. Every single person is equal under God. I want that truth, that value, to inform how I, how I, as a citizen of the United Kingdom, make my choices. Okay? So therefore, <clears throat> It is unacceptable to me. Do come in and sit down. No problem. It is simply unacceptable to me. You can tell me what you think later. It is unacceptable to me that somebody should be... It will be decided how they are treated when they come in, people come into this country, whether or not they happen to have a, Brit a United Kingdom passport. Whether they are as Nigel Farage says, a Briton or not. How we treat them, if we are truly following the values of the kingdom of heaven, of kingdom of God who created heaven and earth, how we treat immigrants matters. We cannot simply say, go back home, or you're not allowed here, because these are people made in the image of God of equal value to me and to you. So what is best for them is as important as what is best for me, is as important as what is best for us as citizens of the United Kingdom. So I cannot vote for UKIP. I cannot vote for UKIP and its agenda because it, I see it as contradictory to the values of the kingdom of heaven. You'll have your own view. In the kingdom of heaven, this is a theme that goes right through the whole testament that Jesus picked up, not just in his teaching, but in the way he lived. In the kingdom of heaven, the poor are to be lifted up and the rich are to be torn down from their thrones. The proud are to be humbled and the humble are to be lifted up. That's everywhere. It's a theme that goes through the entire scripture is one that the prophets bang on about century after century after century. Why do they keep going on about it? Because nobody listens. So, <clears throat> if a political leader says to me, it's important that the rich people get richer, and in order to do that, we need to cut the taxes of the rich further, that is in direct contradiction to the values of the kingdom of heaven. Everything must be done to lift up the poor. Everything possible must be done to bless them. That's a fundamental value of the kingdom of heaven. Now, I'm not an economist, so I can't go into the detail of that. There are others like Nigel who can. But we cannot allow the rich to get ever richer and richer at the expense of the poor. There are Hundreds of people working in Luton below the minimum wage who are being exploited, working in, effectively in slavery conditions. This cannot be right. This matters. That's poor and the rich. If a fundamental value within the kingdom of God, within the kingdom of heaven, is freedom for all, not just for United Kingdom subjects or whatever else, then what little, that little girl Malala did is of supreme and cosmic importance. I really praise God that that little Muslim girl has been given 
the, um, the uh, Nobel Peace Prize. I think that is amazing. She said, when she was speaking, I think it was to the United Nations, she said, one child, one teacher, one book, one pen can change the world. You'll remember um, Malala's story. She was a little schoolgirl in Pakistan, wasn't it? And she, uh, she didn't really agree with the Taliban regime that uh, girls should not be given an education. So she started to speak up against it. And she ended up being shot by the Taliban in her bus going to school. You remember the story? And that has to be God that rescued her for all the operations in, that um, happened in Birmingham. And now you see her really a prophet to the nations, a prophet saying the value of freedom really, really matters. Women are of equal value to men. They should, or they should would have equal opportunities as men. That has to be fundamental to the kingdom of God. And, you know, I'll come to that in a minute. Yeah. Okay. Here's the next bit, the last one. <clears throat> If a fundamental value in the kingdom of God is that in Christ, yes, in Christ, there is neither male nor female, Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, then that same principle means that in Christ, whoever is in Christ is a new creation. And all these things that may divide us or separate us out or have been problems through history. They all simply melt away and fall away. You see? It all falls away. Galatians 3.28. Therefore, my friends, it is of no consequence whether the next vicar of Christchurch Bushmead is a black woman or a white male or whatever. It is of no consequence whatever. I have no insight knowledge. <laughs> I really don't know. But what I do know, and what I do believe, and I shall be praying from this moment onwards, that God has his way, and that whatever prejudices any might, anybody might ever have would simply fall away under the single principle of the, ki in the kingdom of God. There is neither male nor female, black nor, black nor white, slave nor free, Jew nor Gentile, Roma nor Gadjo, whatever else you want to have. It falls away. So my, my dream for this church, as I begin to think of how, what will happen when I retire, my dream for this church is that those values, if I can leave no other legacy than this, that's worth le leaving. My, my, my prayer is that these values will be right at the, at the heart of what we stand for here. Only a few months left to say these things. And you see, the wonderful thing, if you tie this in with Elijah's showdown on Mount Carmel, his contest with the prophets of Baal, is that actually we don't have to worry. We don't have to engineer anything. All we have to do is stand for the living God because he will actually have his way. <laughs> he will have his way. We can say, okay, God, Show everybody, show everybody how it is in your kingdom. We need you to show it. And whatever you need us to do, we'll do it. So I just love the story of, of, of Elijah on Mount Carmel because he actually, he actually pours water over his altar, gallons and gallons of water over his altar to make it even more difficult for God to set it on fire. Do you see? So um, God... The living God, whose presence is too great to even be fitted into the temple in Jerusalem. Yeah? Heaven and earth cannot contain you, Yahweh. There's not enough space in our temple to contain you, because you are literally Lord of heaven and earth, of everything that is. One unseen God, made manifest unequivocally, in the face of Jesus Christ. So, just to wrap a few things up here. We need to contrast these two worlds, the kingdoms of the world, which come and go. The kingdom of heaven. The religion of King Ahab was tribal. 
But the faith of Elijah was in Yahweh, who even heaven and earth could not contain. Let's just stay with that. If our united kingdom is tribal, keep out. In my, I'll just say this because it, it sounds offensive, but it was what I was brought up in Harlow in 1960 when I was growing up as a little boy there. People used to shamelessly say, keep the wogs out of Calais. Right? That's what they used to say in the playground. We had one black boy in the school, one in a school of a thousand. And even me thought, that's not very nice. That's no good. And they used to say horrible things about my Swiss mother. I gather they say, people say horrible things about all mothers, but anyway, they did about my Swiss mother. And this has to be challenged. So you see, one litmus test for this is, is my political party or my, my practice or what I stand for, is it tribal? Is it tribal? Is it me and my group over against all the others? Because if it is, it's not of God. Because in the kingdom of God, the faith of Elijah, the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, it is not tribal, but it is embraces everybody. So... The religion of Ahab and the prophets of Baal was exclusive. But the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is universal. And as Abraham was told, your descendants will be more numerous than the grains of sand on the seashore and the stars in the sky. So his faith, the true faith of the one living God, in whom everybody is made in his image, is universal. The religion of Ahab was unstable. People were being thrown all over the place all the time. There was, everything was rocking. James, in his epistle, talks about people being of unstable faith, being like a boat, you know, rocking up and down on the waves. And the f all unstable, unstable religion, inauthentic religion, is about that. So if you're in the midst of a, a political storm that's going on or any kind of a thing, and everything is rocking and there's no stability, you know that people are forgetting that Yahweh is Lord, that he is the king of kings and lord of lords, and will have his way. Elijah says to all the people, what, stop tottering, stop wavering between two opinions. Make your mind up. Who is in charge? All these bales, all these things, all these false gods, or the unseen one true God, Yahweh. Religion of Abraham was unstable, the faith of the children of God, you and I, is built not on sand, but on rock. To pick up Jesus' parable in Matthew 7. When the winds come, the rains beat down, the house that stands is the one that is built on rock. What is the rock? The values of the kingdom of God as revealed in the Holy Scriptures. Finally, the religion of Ahab was temporary. It came and it went. One king goes, one king, another one comes. It, it is temporary. All the Caesars, the Roman Empire, have passed, gone forever. But the scriptures tell us of the Messiah who took flesh in Jesus Christ. The scriptures tell us of the increase of his government, there will be no end. So be it. Amen.